All right, welcome to session two of Success Essentials for uh, Disruptive Times. Yesterday, we covered um, how to clarify and fund your priorities. And so we also did a little table setting, which is why that call went a little bit longer than the advertised 30 minutes. We um, talked about uh, allegiance capital. We talked about the difference between the distinction between intelligence and learning. We talked about open loop learning. We talked about the rocky road between action and intention. All before we got into the main event, which was um, that recapture and reallocate uh, practice that is also doubles as um, not just a way to fund your priorities, but to clarify your priorities. The basic uh, premise being, if you have gone through all of your expenses and identified where all your discretionary income is going, and you're not willing to make any changes in that in order to fund your priorities, what you say are your priorities, probably not really your priorities and just a good opportunity to reflect and think about what really does matter to me. Um, here in session two, we are going to talk about how to set up and maintain your success system. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to drop some links in the chat. And I'm going to do them. Let's see. Let's do these one at a time. Because less is more, right, Sandra? <laughs> so number one is the um, is my Substack. So I am going to be sharing along the way, uh, and as you are taking notes, I would encourage you to write down um, anytime I say there's a resource a, more a, about you know where you can learn more about this in the Substack. So if you go to that Substack um, and you're not already subscribed, I'd encourage you to subscribe at whatever level you're comfortable um, and uh, then use the search feature in the Substack to access any um, any of the, the resources that, I, that I'm sharing. Uh, it looks like this next one is kind of acting weird. I don't know why. Nope, it's there. So that is the um, link to the uh, the Creative on Purpose community on Success Finder. It is a free community. There is a free sustainable goal setting and achievement course. There is a free Art of Encore Living course. There is a free Stoicism one-on-one -on -one course there. Uh, there's a free um, kind of business diagnostic where you can kind of audit your offer audience and uh sales strategy um, by going through um, seven or so short videos. Uh, I encourage you to join that because the bonus session or the bonus that I'm the bonus that I'm referenced um, earlier, uh, for those of you that that go ahead and add some sort of uh, comment, takeaway, reflection, on social media, you'll get invited to a uh, special bonus session and that will occur inside the Success Finder community. So, um, and the reason for that is that Success Finder off has Zoom integration that offers a level, a, a, an additional level of security. I'm, I'm pretty big on creating, you know, the safest container I can for all these calls. So eventually all of the community calls both for success finder community members and Substack subscribers will be in that uh, Zoom. And then the, the next one is again, a lot of what I'm referencing or I will frequently reference principles and philosophy that comes from the Guardian Academy. Uh, and um, sometimes I will reference their language about things I've been talking about for a long time, just because um, their perspective really um, resonates with a lot of folks. And so some of you were kind enough to subscribe to the Guardian Substack yesterday using this link, which gives me a little, just a credit for referring you. Um, I am now in third place. So thank you. You're, you, the, you those of you who subscribed, help me put, put me back in second place. I'm still, a, or I'm sorry, back into third place. Uh, I'm still a good distance from second place. Um, but, uh, I'll get there eventually. And you know, again, the incentive for you is uh, 
when I hit um, the threshold of 23, I'm at 16 right now. Um, I'll get uh, some one-on-one -on -one time with Nick Peterson, um, who I'm lucky enough to spend a couple hours a week with already in a group call. But those insights that I get from Nick get passed right on to you. All right. And before we jump into today's like official stuff, um, I would love if one or two of you would be willing to share a takeaway from yesterday's call. But yeah, the only caveat is you have to be able to do it in like 10 seconds or so. Any Anybody want to come off mute and uh, share something that they gleaned from the conversation yesterday? Oh, I sent all those links to, only to Cato. I'm sorry about that. I'll fix that while, while you all are sharing a takeaway. Go ahead, Yusuf. Hi. Um, the biggest takeaway was action precedes clarity. That was the biggest takeaway. I love that. Yeah. Posture informs mindset, not the other way around. Anybody else? Go ahead, Sandra. I'm going to get moving and shaking. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Please, someone share another one because I need to get all these uh, links correct, uh, put put in the general chat. So if anybody has anybody else is brave enough to volunteer or take away, you can also if if you have a criticism, share criticism. If you if you got nothing, nothing, no no takeaway from uh, yesterday's session. Although it would be really weird if you didn't have a, get any value and you're here anyway. Are you leaning in, Megan, or? I was looking at the links, but I'll say something too. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, there's a really, there. there's, I, I think, I'm open to being wrong, um, but I think there's a pretty clear vibration um, that, that that occurs when someone is really bringing relational qualities into the work they're doing and and the the conversations they're having and and particularly when it's in the realm of business um you, you know i think a lot of people could say that they they feel that right um and from my experiences and 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 from my dialogues with the people that i work with i know that there is there's this um under territory of people who even can't bear, you know, and I, you, you produce a pretty significant amount of that steadiness vibration and it makes everything that you share more effective. Yeah. Um, and really miraculous for me to, to get to engage with. Um, so I, I want other people to get to have contact with that too. I really appreciate that. It, 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 I appreciate that very much. And it makes me want to share something that really flipped the script for me because, um, you know, we just live in this world that, that um, seems very transactional, that seems to reward absolute certainty about things that, about which there could not possibly be any certainty. And, you know, you don't have to scroll social media or, or, channel surf traditional media for very long to see that like in play and what happened when things when i when i changed my way of showing up and really embraced this idea of just being present with whoever i was engaged with at any given moment um everything changed and this is the big a big takeaway that I was kind of reserving for the end, but I'm gonna share it now and I'll probably share it again later, or if I forget it, I'm, I'm sharing it now. The actual reward of doing meaningful work with people you care about is not, is not money and it's not status and it's um, not anything else. Those are just side effects. If you show up, and do the work that you're meant to do. If you show up 
fully presently and engage with the intent to be useful and helpful to the person on the other end of the conversation or the group of people at the other end of the conversation, you will never, you will never lack for anything that you need, you know, just to get by in the world in terms of um, money or relationships or reputation or any of those things. Presence is, um, is all that's required. And that may land as obvious with everyone on this call, but I catch, I, I try to practice it. I've tried to remind myself about it every time I I'm about to get on a call and I still forget. And I still catch myself thinking transactionally, if not speaking transactionally. So, um, and, and every time I do that, I just end up getting in my own way and not, Nobody gets what they want. Person that I'm talking to doesn't get helped and I don't get to feel fulfilled and, and feel like I've done something useful. And, and I don't usually, um, you know, make anything else out of that uh, kind of approach. So I really appreciate that, Megan. Um, once again, just gonna drop one more link in. That is my Facebook profile. Um, if we're not already connected there, I would love to connect there. And if you go to any of the posts that, are you know near the top of the feed now or any future posts and and um, post something you'll get invited to um, what I think is a pretty cool bonus session um, next time. All right, so let's kick off for real how to set up and maintain your success system. And again, I'm going to encourage you to be taking notes and writing things down if you're not a paid subscriber, and um, you know reference uh, the Substack search function to learn more about any of these. So the before we get into building our, our success system, I want to talk about unlearning helplessness and boosting self-efficacy. Unlearning helplessness might sound a little judgy, but it, it it's not. And if you stick with me, I think you'll, 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 you'll understand that, that that's not what I'm getting at. We all practice. Well, I'll start with this question. How many people here have ever ordered something on Amazon or bought something from a, a, a store that has a no questions asked return policy, bought, bought something on impulse, took it home, got it delivered, opened it up, looked at it and said, eh, this isn't really for me. I'll just send it back. Anybody ever done that? Anybody willing to admit? <laughs> <laughs> that they've done that. Uh, so a couple of us are. So that is a, a version of this um, kind of uh, conditioned version of learned helplessness. Like you, you suffer no, like you can, you can have a couple of glasses of wine, see something on TV, go on Amazon and order it. Cause in that inebriated moment you think that looks cool i need that it arrives and you go what the heck was i thinking and just send it back no consequence for your irresponsible behavior for your lack of self-control right so but we also have it kind of this learned helplessness programmed into us um you know we are creatures that we like to know where we stand and what's expected so we you know go to school and we follow the rules we you know, do what our parents tell us. We go along with whatever's going on, even when in, when we can feel in our heart of hearts that it's not the right thing to, to like what's going on is not actually cool, that it's not right. So, and, and, and society, you know, just builds on that programming with, you know, conditioned reinforcers of learned helplessness. And so unlearning helplessness has to be kind of an active pursuit. And you need to be able to figure out how to see, step into, stay in, and share your power, the things that you have control over. And so just to, you know, just we're going to bump up against my affection for Stoic philosophy here, but um, Epic, the, the opening of Epictetus's Enchiridion, the Stoic handbook, is um, t 
tells us that there, there are ultimately just two things within our control, how we see things and what we decide and do next. Everything else is largely beyond our control. But the good news of stoicism is all you need to live a flourishing, thriving, meaningful life is to try to gain control of what's within your control. If you can um, start to uh, be more deliberate and committed and thoughtful and disciplined about how you see things and how you make decisions about what to do next, that's its own reward. That is how you cultivate the virtue that for the Stoics is all that's required to live the good life, to live a meaningful, fulfilled life. And again, speaking to what I was just sharing after riffing on what Megan said, um, if you do that, in my experience, if you do that enough, every, you'll, you'll get everything you want. Everything you really want in life will come to you. If you just work hard at being um, thoughtful and deliberate and disciplined about how you see things and what you decide and do next. Um, I also want to, so this idea comes really from Dan Nicholson's book, um, Rigging the Game, but it's something that's talked about quite a bit in the Guardian Academy. Um, like we talk about the process as a shortcut, that's actually a Nick Peterson-ism, but the shortcut, the process, like to trust, to, to, the process is the shortcut. We've all heard Seth Godin say, trust the process. But before you can trust the process, you have to be able to trust yourself. And that's where the self-efficacy is coming in. That's where you are um, learning how to, uh, learning the, the incredibly important life skills of um, restraint and responsibility. And so the process that I wanna share can be applied to, any, to getting anything that you want in life and um, the, including making the change that you wanna make in the world. And the process as it's laid out in Dan Nicholson's book, Rigging the Game is clarity, certainty and collapsing time. And what I wanna do is invert that process because inverting is always a great way to <laughs> see things more clearly. And as we were, were discussing yesterday, straighten out that vector so that you can get what you want, collapse time in terms of getting what you want. And that's what, that's what collapsing time is like collapsing time is getting after you have clarity about where you really are starting from and with and where you really want to be instead of um, craning between cha the chaos and rigidity of our usual human mindset decision making process raising the floor and and um, narrowing that channel so that we create a straighter line, never a straight line, but a straighter line that allows us to collapse time. Before you can do any of that, you need that um, certainty of like, am I sure this is where I'm starting? And am I sure that this is where I want to go? Am I, and I, do I have some certainty about what's essential in order for me to get that? We talked about that this yesterday. What's, what, what, what are the essentials, components, elements, that need to be achieved for you to get from where you are to where you want to be. And again, going now, stepping back to clarity, like, are you really clear about who you are and what you have? And that was the whole recapture reallocate thing that we did yesterday. Um, I know Cato has spoke to this a little bit in the Q and a yesterday, you know, that it was kind of surprising um, to realize like, actually, most of us are pretty good about knowing where we want to go. I mean, we have goals. We're aiming aspirational creatures by nature as well. Like, you know, although we like to stay humble and hiding and, you know, like to know we embrace the status quo because it reminds us of where we stand and what's expected. But we're also these kind of adventurous aspirational creatures. We like to seek the edges and we like to explore and we have this innate curiosity. So we have that too. And if we lean into that a little bit more, um, and look in the mirror, 
and do a little bit more work on the know thyself part, the, you know, the, the, the exhortation above the um, Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. It's actually three above the Oracle of Delphi. There's, and there's like 120 inside, but the Oracle of Delphi is um, know thyself is number one. Um, nothing in excess is another, less is more. And, um, or kind of like an everything in moderation thing. And now I'm having a brain fart and forgetting the third one, but it'll, it'll come to me and I'll, I'll share it uh, when it does. Um, so anyways, I, I got off track there a little bit, but if you focus first on the clarity piece, who am I? What, what am I here to do? What am I starting with? Where am I starting? And you clarify as, as plainly as possible what you really want. Then the next step is the certainty step of what are the things that are essential that I have to um, do to get there. And then the collapsing time is, you know, what are, what are the resources that I lack that I need to acquire? What, you know, is there a mentor or a guide that can help catalyze my progress? And if you look at, I don't know if anybody here has gone through my, um, I don't, I've worked with several of you, but I, I, I don't think anybody's actually gone through the Catalyst program, but the Catalyst program basically is built on this model. I start with the, the clarity piece is you fill out a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. the, um, and, and I, that questionnaire will clarify for both of us where you are, where you want to be and anything that's in the way. And then we create on the call, the first call, some certainty that we can get there by identifying what's the steps that are required. And then, um, and then the coaching, the one-on-one -on -one work and, you know, the group opportunities um, are the piece that collapse time. Clarity certainty collapse time that's your you have to figure those out for your process whatever success plan you have to get what you want you need to to think about those things and that brings us to system reliability every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets if you have a bloated complicated system it's a crappy system and you will get crappy results that's why we focus on what's essential, because if we focus on what's essential, then we can learn how to do each of those things more effortlessly. And we gain a lot more ease in getting from where we are to where we want to be. We won't burn ourselves out. We don't risk blowing ourselves up. And so with system reliability, we identify, I, I always, when I'm working with clients, let's, let's identify the three things that if you did them well enough, would guarantee your success given enough time. So when I was working with Penny um, and Sandra uh, in um, uh, the coaching business uh, mastery program, I'm sorry, coaching business prescription, I rebranded it coaching business mastery towards the end and it really helped. Um, <laughs> You know, what we decided, the, the three things were, what's your offer, who's your audience, and what's your sales success strategy? And then after we established those three elements of our system, whichever one was the least effective is the one that we raised the floor on. And that raising the floor is the, that's the optimization piece. And Sandra and Penny can confirm this if they like, but what, you know, again, people are usually pretty clear about what they do, their, what their offer is. And they usually are pretty clear about who they want to work with. What ends up always being um, the piece that needs a lot of work is that sales success system, because we talked about this yesterday. Everybody's spending eight hours a day on social media, on their website, on their logo, on their lead magnet, on their email sequence and blah, 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 blah. And they're spending like almost no time actually making a difference with people that they want to coach. So you know, you have to fix that system. You have to, you, you have to figure out how do I get this offer in front of that audience in less than 30 minutes a day. Did you want to say something, Penny? Uh, yeah, I just want to add, I had trouble with identifying my audience and 
that was that was a mess because I couldn't get a strategy. I had a different strategy for every different audience. <laughs> and then I couldn't figure out which was the best. And so I just want to confirm what you're saying. Well, and that's that's me when I'm working with my mentor, <laughs> what my coach, and I've worked, I can't even, I've lost count of how many coaches I've worked with. I'm usually working with at least two at a time. Um, everyone needs help seeing what they don't see. Everyone needs a actual guru, someone who is shedding light on the black holes and, um, you know, in our learning and in our, you know, our delusions, <laughs> you know, and we all have, you know, we're all a little bit delusional about some aspect of ourselves. And of course, we all know some people, um, well known and unknown who are, you know, even more fully delusional. And so like blasting out like clearing the delusions is a really big, you know, kind of important piece of this. So that's, that's all really system reliability is, is how do you create a simple system that will help you get what you want to, where you want to go? And how do you optimize those essential elements, starting with the least efficient and working through and, and you just keep rinsing and repeating that. Now, um, I'll tell you the two fastest ways to fix your system if you already have one. The first is go through your system and get rid of everything that's not helping because system reliability is a multiplicative process. Your system is only as efficient as the product of all of its parts. So if you have, if you're one of those people, again, like just reference the coaching business mastery, if you, um, if you are not getting any return on an investment on your website, on your logo, on your op lead magnet opt-in, uh, all those things, you need to stop paying attention to them. If you're, you know, you're spending hours a day on trying to build a YouTube channel because I'm charlatan guru said YouTube is the only way to, to succeed in business. Beware of dog, dogmatic statements. When, when you hear someone make a dogmatic statement, run run away and run as fast as you can because there are no absolutes. So any anything like that that's not giving you a return on that investment, just clear it out. I am just as guilty as anybody. My first coach, I got into coaching because everyone said I was going to be, I was a great coach. And I said, I don't want to be a coach. Coaching is stupid. And my wife one day said, Scott, this hobby of yours is really expensive. You need to make some money to start paying for all this stuff that you keep signing up for. And so I was like, well, the only thing I know that people want from me is coaching. So I wrote a uh, coaching offer on a Google doc, put a PayPal link on it. And I booked my first 11 clients. That's all I need. That's my, <laughs> that was my system and it worked. And then what did I do? I created a logo. I built a website. I started a YouTube channel. I started a podcast. I started a blog. I created a lead magnet. I built an uh, email sequence. I got tried to be everywhere all the time, all at once on social media. And I ended up spending eight hours a day, nine hours a day, 10 hours a day doing stuff that I told the world I hated marketing stuff, right? I don't hate it anymore, but that's a different discussion for another time. Um, and I was spending almost no time doing what I wanted to do, which was making a difference, working with really cool people um, in which I was involved in really cool conversation. So I had to go all the way back. I had to take all that crap out of my system so that I could just focus on the things that were necessary. So we all do it. And that's kind of speaks to this next point, which is hoses and buckets. If you think of your system as, you know, um, you're going to put a hose Put a leaky, kinky hose in a, a leaky bucket, and then you're going to turn on this, the tap as high as it will go, and then you're going to try to put attach the hose to the tap. That's kind of the metaphor for how I see almost all of us trying to build a business. The first thing to do is attach the hose, then put the hose in the bucket, and then you can turn it on so that you can see where the holes in the bucket are and you should start by patching those. Then you can see where the, the 
kinks in the hose and the holes in the hose that are closest to the bucket are and fix those and work your way all the way back to the tap. And then you can turn up the tap as high as you want to go. You can optimize and maximize as much as you want. But we all start with a leaky bucket, not super clear on our offer, audience and sales strategy, uh, or you know, not don't have a real plan for success. That's the bucket, right? And then the strategy is the leaky kinky hose. And, you know, the offer in the audience is what's coming out of that tap. Like do, you know, you've heard me say this yesterday and many times before, right? Do the right thing at the right time in the right order. And you, you will succeed as long as you have that clarity, um, certainty and plan for collapsing time. And a lot of what I've been talking about and Yusuf, I, I just saw your notes, so thank you for that. Um, Yusuf just referenced force multipliers. And I think we mentioned this yesterday and I'll probably mention it again tomorrow, but force multipliers are simply things that enable you to do whatever it is that you do better, easier, faster in terms of velocity, not, not just plain speed. Force multipliers can be apps and software that you use to optimize certain elements of your business. Um, it could be a relationship with, you know, a community of people like this or working with a trusted guide or mentor. Uh, sometimes, you know, some sort of learning program, you know, that's teaching a skill that you, that's kind of missing, broken or needs work in your ultimate plan can be a force multiplier. Um, it's, Force multipliers are just a, a form of leverage. They help you um, get get what you want a little bit faster, a little bit easier, um, or a lot faster and a lot easier. Uh, and I've mentioned many times that you know, for me, a lot of it, it the biggest force multipliers relationships, the people that you spend your time, attention, and energy on or with. Um, but before you even start to think about um, optimizing and managing those relationships. Anybody want to guess what the the least efficient part of any system is? Some of you know. The least efficient component of any system is the human being at the controls. <laughs> so works with relationships too. You know, the biggest force multiplier to your success is to Become a better version of yourself. Become the kind of person that knows what they want and where they're starting from and has is able to uh, be disciplined and committed and um, uh, maintain their motivation and their intention and their integrity as they figure out and way find their way from where they are to where they want to be. And just to tie it all up in a little bow, if you do all that, it's its own reward. The process is a shortcut and the process is the reward because regardless of what results and outcomes you get, which you ha actually have no control over, you can influence getting results that you want by doing, uh, by doing all the things that we're talking about. But ultimately, you know, the, you could make the best decisions in the world and have the worst outcomes. You can make the worst decisions in the world and have the best outcomes. That's just the way decisions work. Decisions are not outcomes. But when you apply yourself to becoming a better version of yourself and being committed to a daily discipline of doing this work that we're talking about, you will become a better person you will become a more fulfilled person. Your, the things that you do and the people you are with will bring more meaning and fulfillment into your life. And that's good enough. What I find happens is that in addition to all that, the side effects of working at being becoming a, a good person and doing better work is that you end up with an, that kind of prosperity that is usually what we are chasing as the end in and of itself. Money, health, good relationships, they all just become naturally occurring side effects. Status, it all just becomes a naturally occurring side effect of doing the meaningful, 
fulfilling work of becoming a better person, making the difference only you can make in the world and doing that work with and for people that you care about. All right, so that is um, today's presentation. Uh, before we go into the closed um, members only q and I have, um, again, uh, bonuses, special bonuses for you. Any any terms, any, any loops that are remaining open right now, um, I encourage you to keep them open. Um, and if you decide that you need to get a little bit more clarification, uh, just put those things in the search um, at the Creative on Purpose Substack or um, the uh, Guardian Academy Substack. And then um, if you send me an, uh, an email to that address I just dropped in, uh, then I will send you a ebook edition of The Art of Encore Living. In the appendix of that is that Venn diagram that I talked about yesterday, the, the how to define the difference only you can make by defining your values, your talents, and finding um, the people that need your share your values and need your talents to enhance their lives. Um, that is my bonus gift to you just for being the kind of person that shows up and engages uh, on calls like this. And for those of you that want to stick around, I have until uh, my wife is back home. She is waiting for me to make breakfast. I am waiting for me to make breakfast. Um, so I'm not going two hours today, <laughs> um, but I can go uh, as long as 1130 for any of you that, um, you know, that, that, that uh, have questions or want to discuss anything further. Sandra, I see you typing away. Is there something that you need? Yeah, we're going to stay right, right here, Yusuf. Yes, correct, Sandra. Okay, gang, let's, uh, let's get to it. Give me your questions and let's implement some of this stuff. Oh, yes, that is the time for me right now, Yusuf. Uh, right now it's 1041 and at 1130, even if I am in mid riff rant, I will turn this off and go uh, start making an omelet. So what you got, people? Well, one of the things that you had talked about was presence <laughs> at, uh, at the start, right? So that just got me on this whole tear, and that is all I've been riffing on. But attached to that idea of presence is also the idea of the invitation, mm. which is what you've been doing with this, right? This process and what you're doing here is about extending or trying out a different way to invite. And part of what I've observed over many years about invitation is that very few people actually accept really cool invitations. And then now I was just working on like, what's that set theory? Like, you know, but if Seth Godin sets an invitation, but it just got me like, because he's at this other place, right? So, but his ratio is probably still the same ratio. It's just, he reaches larger numbers and it's probably still the same ratio. <laughs> so then I was just like looking at, um, cause I was just writing this thing this morning about like photography. I mean, you can get paid to be a photographer, but photography means more because what's essential I have found being in theater, which is essentially local and present. And the idea of presence is also an aliveness, right? You're present with theater and you're present with the alive actors. And there's an aliveness and an ali a live exchange that's there. Um, but what was more important to me as a theater artist, because I would like put stuff out and I started to learn to take really good photos, was most people aren't going to come see the show. You know, there's going to be 100 people, maybe, all together over two nights, three nights, that really see the thing. What I need to do, though, is I need to make sure a couple thousand people know they missed something that can never happen again in the same way that it happened. Like, they can still read the play, see the play. It's never going to be that. So how would I communicate that? And that's photography. And learning to take photographs that told a story, because it's a story, not a beautiful photo of a portrait. It's like... You need to know you miss this moment, this alive moment. And I've also seen you using that in how you're building this community because the community is about aliveness. And then how do people do that? And it started look, making me, I know this is like random thoughts, but that's because they just came out. But like, and so when you're doing the act of invitation, are you casting a net or are you casting a line? 
like because they'd be different functions. And I've seen you experiment with both of those, Scott. And I know that just over, you know, just trying to get people to come to theater and come do arts things. Like it's always like, am I casting the net or am I casting this line? And how do you do that? What, what are those differences? So your idea of presence at the very top got me thinking about that because it was either yesterday or today that we were talking about coming or it got into my mind about table work and coming to table. Mm -hmm. I think something you said yesterday got me thinking about table work yeah, because of the value of being at the table. But your value is when I try to help people teach teach them this skill, it's about just being present. It's not about being smarter than the play. It's not about being smarter than anyone else. It's simply about me learning to understand how I'm reacting and why. And that's going to be the basis of how I share it. But if I've come with predetermination, that taints it. It makes it kind of just icky. It's, it's about how do I not worry about knowing anything. And when, I think it was you said the thing at the very top about learning. Anyway, it, it keyed into, I, I think I typed it actually, this idea of it was when I, when I learned as a theater artist to not hyper focus and instead to notice when the play came and got me. And that that was the beginning of me understanding how the play was in playing on me, my humanness, and starting to understand that. And that that was valuable to share with the other artists trying to improve their work or whatever. So it was like the same kind of thing as you're doing with this coaching and that thing that clicked for you was the same thing that many years ago clicked for me. And since then I've been honing that because that is like the super valuable thing. And that's when you can be about, and then you get invited to all kinds of tables, which is what got me onto this whole riff of invitation. So everything you said fed in more into like, this sideways conversation I had in my notebook <laughs> about this culmination. So anyway, that's my um, flood of thoughts. <laughs> no, that's really awesome. I'm so, <laughs> it's so interesting that you brought up the idea of invitation because one of the reasons why I decided I'm not releasing all the replays until Wednesday is that they will be part of um, the Wednesday edition of the newsletter which is only fully available to paid subscribers but there is a preview for um free subscribers and that preview when people right before people hit that paywall they will be invited to take a moment pause and consider like is it worth 750 or nine dollars to see the four videos that are going to be below that paywall line. And, and if they're not, that's okay. Like if not, that's okay. Um, it, but if you want to, if you want to take a chance, take a chance on me, take a chance on yourself. You, I actually further invite them. Like you can, you can subscribe. And you have seven days to cancel that subscription before your card is charged. So you could literally like take in all the, the exclusive content and then um, go back to free or tell me to F off and, uh, you know, cancel, unsubscribe. I, I mean, there's, and I love your metaphor about the, the, um, the fishing with a net or a line that's that's brilliant i'm stealing that one um the i've adopted saying uh, there, there are things that i say that i that i can directly attribute to other people um that you know that that i've heard say them like and that's okay is something i'm saying a lot right now because i am more and more leaning into this edge of generous empathetic polarization if you are colliding with my content, I want you to make a decision. This is this kind of stuff is for me, and I'm going to read the next line. Or this stuff is not for me, and I am walking on. You know, I the whole idea of less is more, or uh, and that more does not get you closer. Less is more. Is if you're trying to be, you know, this is kind of plays into what you're saying about fishing lines and net. Like if you're trying to appeal to everyone, you will appeal to no one. If you know, that's, it's kind of like the nice and kind discussion that we had yesterday. If you just want everyone to like you, 
that's you can you you can go viral you know impressions are not impact you know uh what what, what was the name gang gangham gang style or whatever that that video that went viral you heard anything else from that guy since when was the last time you went to that video right like he he went viral he got all the impressions what actual impact does that have you know you don't need the the you can make a real and we're, we're going to talk about this in the training next month um you can make a really good living just working with the innovators and the early adopters on the adoption curve you can make a really good living and never have anyone else know who you are and so I would suggest just to to pick up on your metaphor, like if you if you have an idea, a cause, a product, a service that you want to spread, that you want to get the word out, that you know will make a difference in people's lives, if you start with that fishing line and just show up fully and presently with the intent of doing nothing but being helpful and useful, you will, you will, if you have a hundred of those conversations, you will never lack for business ever. You will never not be able to make a living doing what you love to do. But it begins by, if you solve, solve a hundred people's problems first, they because what 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 are people actually paying you for when they pay you i can I, and i have i can literally take use chat gpt to turn anybody into my coach i can i can have alex harmozy be my business coach i can have seth godin be my life coach i i literally can do that i can get I have instant access to any information, to any implementation strategy, anything I want, chat GPT will spit out to me. No one is paying you for your information. They are paying that the information is, is information is free. And if your information sounds too innovative, nobody's going to listen to you except for just that little tiny percentage of it innovators and they're hard to find the first step is to turn your innovation your big idea your your um, clever process whatever it is turn it into information how can people access this and and how you know that it's the adopt the adoption decisions how can they see the relative value in what you do compared to what the how other people do the same thing how can they observe the change in other people how can they try it out, right? These are all things that I try to bake into everything that I'm doing. And if if you're if you're if exposure to that information interests them, they will then um, start to try to get a little bit closer closer to you. They will try to gain access. But what they'll really pay for, and they'll pay a little bit for access. You all are paying for a little bit of access. But what they really will pay for is proximity to implement the information they need in their unique circumstance or situation to get from where they are to where they want to be and whatever it is that you help help people do that. They will pay for that. And ChatGPT will never do that. And people will never stop paying for it because we can't, we think we can, we're smart, rational creatures that can DIY it. So we justify not investing in ourselves and we can't. We are so fraught with cognitive biases and false beliefs and cognitive distortions. We, it's impossible for anyone to simply go do it alone. And not only that, it's, it's, it's not a great way to, to, um, to live, to try to be the lone wolf 
and do it all on your own. So the last thing I'll say on invitation is yes, I try to be very invitational in everything I put out there and encouraging the right people to come a step closer and encouraging the wrong people to please move along. The best invitations are the ones that I don't make. They're the ones that you all make, right? The best invitations come from the people that you have delighted so thoroughly that they can't possibly stop themselves from talking about the change that you help them make or the work that you do or or the the photography that you share um or the the great work that you do with people that feel largely invisible in their communities that with the difference that you're making in in fundraising uh what have you so i call it the discipline of delight if you can delight you delight enough people they will talk about it and again observability like everybody will say things like i there's just like the the brand the 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 harley davidson tattoo have you all heard this like marketing thing like can people see the brand that you love right and so the harley davidson tattoo or the harley davidson belt buckle or you know just looking like a harley davidson biker like people see that and that's that's a way of spreading the word and what you know and then people say about there's nothing about my like nobody's going to put my logo on their on their um forearm and um you know nobody wears my teeth like people try to just like make a t-shirt and it's like then nobody wears a t-shirt and they're like what the hell i spent all that time on a t-shirt nobody's wearing it how am i going to get people to see the kind of work that you all do will change the way people show up in the world and the people that know these people will notice that the way this that person shows up in the world is different and they'll say what the hell is going on with you how did you get to be you know so happy how did you get to be doing such great you know, work now? How did you um, meet all those uh, um, income figures for the, the last campaign, whatever, like people will notice and they'll say, and then, and then the person will say, I didn't think that people like me could ever succeed in what I'm trying to succeed in. But I, I talked to Megan, I talked to Nasley, I talked to Yusuf, I talked to Penny, I talked to Cato, and it changed everything. And those kind of invitations are the invitations that are going to make you never lack for anything that you really want in life. I got almost, I got, got a little over 30 minutes, but I, you know, if you want to, I, I could, I could definitely go for some bacon and eggs. <laughs> go ahead, Yusuf. Hi, um, so it's not really a question, but it's a short, short um, thing I'm trying to solve in my life. Um, a bit of context. Uh -huh. I have a science background uh, all toward, towards, uh, throughout, throughout school, uh, high school. I didn't go to university, but um, and then now my entire life revolves around creativity and managing my own creative self, managing my own creative business, and then managing other creative businesses and other creative people. And I have found that the creative um, employee type versus the creative business person is, a, is they're so different. And I'm trying, I, I am the creative business person who is struggling because I don't know how to manage my daily operations, whether it be of like personal, just life or the business. So I, I it's not a question, but it's more like a, here's a thing, please help uh, with the whole, that is a question. Um, yeah. It, I'm I'm frazzled. Um, but that's that was that's the gist of it. That's what I've written down. 
and I uh, and any, anybody's welcome to be like, hey, this is the way. This is our way. Well, th we're going to actually do that. That's kind of going to be the topic of the bonus call on Tuesday. We're really going to do a deep dive on tomorrow's session will be mostly like sustainability and optimization of that system that will help you achieve your priorities um, and have resources to spare. But the bonus session is going to um, really kind of deep dive into like, how do you make success inevitable? Like, how do you stop struggling as a creative business helper? Um, so I'm not going to give away all the goodies right now, Yusuf, because they're, they're coming up. Um, but a couple of reflections that, that I probably would not have thought of to talk about on Tuesday. One is... We have, we are masterful at creating limitations that don't actually exist in our lives. One of the biggest ways we do that is, is by falling into what I call the identity trap. And that is in no way meant to disparage the value of and importance of identity. There are really, really good reasons, you know, that um, I would never tell someone that's, you know, um, part of a movement like Black Lives Matter or Me Too, you know, has fallen into some sort of identity trap. You know, that identity, those identities matter a great deal and should, you know, to the people that self-identify that way. And if we over overly attached to any, you know, we're, we're not singular creatures. Like you're not just, you know, I am, I am not just a straight old white guy. Like that's maybe what people see, you know, cause we're so eager to put people in a box so that we can decide whether we like them or not, whether we're going to listen to them or not, or whether we're going to pay attention or not, or even if we want to be aware of them or not but you know we're we are all many splendid creatures and if you overly fixate on any particular identity and attach and cling to it too too firmly for too long you are you are creating limitations that don't have to exist so i say this yusuf because um i'll, I'll give you two examples the first is not directed at anybody but when I'm working with people, I, I kind of, an identity I put on all the people I work with is we're difference makers. We're people that want to make a difference in the world. We want to be and do more and better. And we want to make the world a better place. We want, and almost all of them, you know, as we're putting together our um, offer and our audience and our sales strategy, um, which is also a, a marketing strategy, um, you know, if, if there's any element of that, that has to do with them, like showing up live on camera or at an event or putting content out that features their image or any of that, they're like, oh, I'm an inter introvert. I can't do that. It's like, I don't know. You showed up here, like, you know, you, I mean, introversion is is again, just one of those identities that I think is overly used and there's too much emphasis. Like it's a spectrum, the introvert, extrovert. This is my opinion and I am open to disagree, you know, people disagreeing with it. And I'm open to, my loop is open, change my mind. But the way I look at it, it's a spectrum. I am an introvert and nobody here would believe me when I say that because I present as an extrovert, and I clearly get energy from these kind of things. But in my heart of hearts, what I want to do is spend all day by myself. Because I love what's going on in here. And I could sit in a darkened room all by myself with my, my thoughts, and I would be completely happy.
I would feel energized, I would feel fulfilled and so forth. So when I do things like this, I am actually doing something that's not really part of what I think of as, as my nature, but I'm able to move back and forth. You know, it's time to do the extra thing, Scott, you know, go put on your clown suit and dance for the kids. Okay. Now I'm going to come, you know, now I'm going to come back. I mean, I was, you know, just like any introvert, I was exhausted after yesterday, yesterday, two hours of conversation. And I, I took a nap. Didn't even have Jasper here as an excuse. So I say all that to set up the, the whole thing around creatives, because like when people, I see this a lot on um, LinkedIn, like headlines and profiles. I'm a, I'm a creative coach. I'm a, uh, I'm a resource for creative um, businesses and, 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 uh, and so forth. It's like, we're all, you know, we're all creative creatures. <laughs> Creativity is a natural human instinct. It's a natural, it's a, it's a skill that we all, practice every day. This is an act of creation, conversation, communication, connection, collaboration. It's all a creative act. So don't get, you, you know, what I find, and, and I say this as someone that's guilty of all the time, like if I, when I overly cling to any of the identities that I feel connection to, if I cling to them a little bit too much and too long, I start to get kind of precious about those things and it impedes my ability to see all the possibilities it's puts it puts limitations around what i do and how i do it and why i do it and who i do it with and who i don't so i would encourage you to be have more open loops around how you talk about who you are and what you do and who you do it with um, that would be, that would be one, like just, just avoid the identity trap. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't use identifiers just means don't be, don't create limitations with them, um, by, by trapping yourself a little too much or a little too long in any particular identity. And then the, the, the other piece of it, Yusuf, it, it really does in my estimation, always come down to first reasoning from first principles like if i want to do do this what's how do i create clarity certainty and collapse time and if you invert that and work backwards it will expedite your ability to achieve anything and I'm just realized I said one one other thing. So my my guitar students have this thing about working with me where I always say, let's do that one more time. Let's do that one more time. Let's do that one more time. And they say, let me guess. We're going to do that one more time, one more time. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going to try to make this be my final point about this. Um, well, no, I, no, I got two. Okay. Another creativity, playing music, doing meaningful work, meaningful, fulfilling work with people you care about. I think it's supposed to be fun. They call it playing the guitar, not working the guitar. I can't tell you how many kids I have to wear down with bad dad jokes until they actually crack a smile or will take a chance on singing a song that they desperately want to but won't because they're afraid because they identify as the kind of person that does not speak out in public the more playful and fun you have the more delighted you will be the better the ideas will come and the easier everything that you want will will come and For all of you, this is circling back a little bit to Cato's point about invitation. If you can't, if you're not yet at the point where other people are inviting their connections to come hang out in the places where you hang out, then um, do your work out loud and in public. This is also circling back to the whole information. Um, nobody pays for information. If people pay for information, they pay for that proximity, that help, that direct 
um, connection. Everything that I know about building a successful business and, and living um, a fulfilled, meaningful life is available for free. It's just information. I do it as much as I can out loud and in public. And then I create some friction points. Like you can see my social media stuff, my YouTube channel, my podcast broadcast. You can see it all. It's all there. Take it or leave it. Love it or hate it. It's there. When you become a little bit interested, when you decide that you trust me enough to give me permission to have a little bit more connection and, and I provide a little bit more access, there's a little friction. You know, sign up for the Substack. I'll invite you to a, some free calls. And when you're ready for proximity, a little bit more friction. Yeah, I, I can help you with that, but you're going to have to pay me $9 a month or $90 a year or $1,000 you know, a month, whatever it is. Um, if you are really intentional about your invitations and you extend them with integrity, you will be fine. It's a, it's, it's a long game. There's, you know, it's, you, you said this earlier, Yusuf, it ain't sexy until it is. <laughs> Does that help? Uh, yeah, it does a lot. And uh, I'm going to stop here because uh, if I keep on, I, I think I can do this for 12 hours a day. So I'm just going to stop here. That's okay. <laughs> Megan, Nasli, Penny, any reflections, questions, personal problems that I can ignore? I, I did want to say I, I really appreciated where Cato brought in the um, you, you reach the, the the hundred people who end up in the seats versus the thousand people who you got to make sure they they know that they missed something really cool. Um, that was a really good frame for me to have been brought into the rest of this conversation. I I um I'm this is a lot of the 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 place where my thinking is a lot of the time is that there are entertainment aspects to everything that I'm doing that are really healing um for people who who don't who don't get to have fun because they're not they're they, they they're not resourced well enough to get to have fun and so wherever we have really nutritive stuff come out like there are a lot of theater projects there are a lot of um, art gallery projects um and the thinking about it in terms of the of the theater billing um and and i i done stage theater and opera and music and and so that that's a a, a really helpful language to me so that frame kind of clicked into place with the rest of it and i really appreciated that nice yeah kate is a smart cookie she knows <laughs> stuff and things and she's creative <laughs> she's creative yeah i i think um it's a, a great reflection Megan, and just to amplify one thing that you said, you know, it's and and Nasli, you you were talking about this as your biggest takeaway from yesterday's session, like this whole idea of sufficiency, like what is enough, and we're not programmed for that. We're programmed for more. A hundred is not enough. I need more, but more doesn't get you necessarily closer to the difference you want to make because if. Um, and, and the, the personal example I'll share is, I think I've sh shared this a little bit yesterday, but you know, when I, when I first collided with Seth Godin and took and participated in Alt MBA six, which feels a hundred years ago is uh, August of 2016. I went in with this idea that I, I wanted to take my very successful, um, professional guitar playing and, and teaching career and, and put it online and make millions of dollars while I was sleeping and traveling the world. By the time I finished that program, I didn't, didn't even want to be a musician or own a guitar studio anymore, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, I did what I just suggested to use. I just did everything out loud and in public. I just started blogging and broadcasting and engaging in conversations with people. And 
and avoiding the thing that I now feel like I was meant to do, which is coaching. Like I just, just I thought coaching was stupid. Didn't want to do it. And when I finally paid attention to what the world was telling me, to what life was actually calling me to do, my life was speaking to me because it wanted to speak through me, but I was like, nah, 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 don't, not listening. Um, I came, I, I adopted another Seth Godin principle, which is the first 10. So I did it with my, before I became a coach, I did it with my first book, The Stoic Creative, the world's worst title for a book ever. And the sales reflect that. But before I wrote the book, I said, if 10 people will order this book before I even write it, I will put myself on the hook and I will write it by whatever. It was like, I gave myself three months, six months, something like that. 11 people bought the book. Before I wrote it, I wrote the book. And for a long time, the 11 people that paid for it before I wrote it were the only people that read it. And I went to Seth Godin. I actually, the very first time I ever met Seth in public, I was like, only 10, you know, there's only 11 people that have read this book. And he's like, 10 is enough. You can, you can turn 10 people into a, into a cause, into a movement, into a community, figure out how to do that. And so I released a new edition of the book that included a call to action to reach out and uh, with any revisions or suggestions for the book and to jump on um, some live calls to uh, talk, talk about the ideas in the book. And those 10 people joined calls. And then they started talking to their friends about these cool calls that were happening with this weird dude that talks about stoicism. And more books got sold. And my community grew and my influence, you know, and, and status grew and my coaching business when I launched it, you know, landed 10 clients with nothing but a Google Doc and a, and a PayPal link. And so that whole like 100 people, I would have killed for 100 people, Cato, killed for 100 people to show up at something that I did for the first time or the hundredth time. So that whole idea of sufficiency that Megan was kind of referencing is, is really, really important. Like establish what enough is. Go ahead. Well, I, here's something I have observed about these, the idea of first time versus then when you start doing the thing, because there's this drop off, which you might've experienced Scott or other people, because what I noticed was every time I, cause I was doing this new play development group thing and we would put together festivals of new plays and what would happen was if you were a person who is pretty new to the whole thing and had never really had a play out before and your play was kind of like a little woogie um but we'd have to get extra chairs <laughs> at the library but that mean a couple of the other established people that tended to have like a churn and every six months we'd have a new another play that was being workshopped or whatever that we would do locally before we were sending them out places and we would get like 20 people maybe maybe 15 because also we would lead off to help get people even knowing that they missed the thing. That was usually the thing like, oh, no, I missed it. Yeah, well, there's one coming up next Wednesday, too. It's like, And then it would grow. But it was like, and then if they started like doing more, they would then experience the drop off, too, for a little while until it like stabilized for how you then pull them out. So we learned a thing about like frequency. <laughs> also, people just always assume there's going to be another one. That's part of what I'm trying to let people know in my community now is like, hey, all of you all that say, I'm going to get to one of these one of these days. The one I'm doing this next next month is the last one. So come see it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I just thought I'd let you know this this weird little thing that can happen, which can be a little discouraging. But we also found it funny because when we'd get plays other places in other towns where we were the new thing, we would get people. <laughs> so anyway, you can create that urgency without being a slime ball like, you know, the you ever like signed up for something and they say um, price goes up after midnight tonight by now. And then the next day they say, Oh, there was a problem with the email server. And so we're going to extend it for two more days. Right. It's like that kind of like, that's, that's just BS. Right. But I will frequently say, you know, I'm, I've got three spots in my next um, catalyst cohort, um, you know, before, before the prices might go up because they might, I mean, I'm seriously thinking about it. And so 
They might not. You're like, there's, this is a closed session. You have to, you know, sign up now or else you're going to miss out. So definitely ways to do all of this. So Yusuf, I, I will come to you, but first I want to go to Penny and or Nasli if, if you have any any questions or anything you wanted to share before we wrap up because we only got about 10 no, minutes. I, I really liked reviewing the system reliability and I like the metaphor with the bucket because I was able to really connect that with what I'm trying to do. So that was helpful. And I liked <clears throat> Cato's whole thing on imitation. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the leaky kinky hose and the leaky bucket is a great metaphor because it really, <laughs> it definitely paints the picture that most of us are. <laughs> and it, again, like the, the system reliability thing, like instead of instead of doing more, you 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 find the black holes, you fix you fix you know like find the black holes, and either get rid of them if you don't need them, or fix them if if you do. Like I'm always big about like, you know, is there anything missing? Is there anything broken? Is there anything that needs work? And if I can address those three things in what's already going on, I've automatically optimize things. I'm already creating a, uh, a straighter line and a, a increasing velocity by helping the vector. How about you, Nasli? Uh, yeah, this is great. Learned a lot and uh, lots of gems. Uh, you know, one thing I struggle with and it's a work in progress, it's how to develop a thick skin. Because we want to draw people that resonate with our work and just like you said, you know, let the others that don't resonate. But sometimes people can be very mean. Mm -hmm. So, and I get derailed. And then it's hard to get back on track. And it, it takes me a while. And so it's the last time. Go go to the Substack and type in um, advice, feedback, and criticism. Um there's a chapter from the Stoic Creative, funnel, funnily enough, about that. And then there's some tips for navigating that. Um, the One of the founders of Kajabi um, has become a friend. And, and early on in our friendship, he was asking, you know, because he, he was kind of forced out of the company. Um, and was building his next thing. And he was talking about like, I need to put my armor on and go to battle. I was like, no, you don't. Like, I don't think that's a good, like, why does it have to be a battle? Like, why can't it be a dance? Um, and, you know, why do you have to armor up? You know, I mean, and so a lot of my immediate kind of reflection to you, Nasli, is, um, is, around boundaries and guardrails and who 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 do you let in and who do you not who do you pay attention to and who do you not and um being really intentional obviously it helps to just be really intentional about where you're doing what you're doing but even if even if you are there there are you know there are people out there that are sociopaths and psychopaths and you know trolling and all that that's and you know that those are all real things for sure but um i i just so for me i want feedback and and like everyone i don't really it always hurts a little when when someone provides criticism um, but honestly, the most helpful thing is advice, but the, those are three different things. Like if you give what you think is feedback that I have not solicited you for, like if I, like feedback is something I will request from specific people. 
people outside of that circle will often offer me what they think is helpful feedback, but it's actually just criticism. And my, I, I adopted this phrase, Nosley, that I offer to you just in case it helps. But I, um, when someone, some stranger or someone who's like, whose work I'm not very fond of or whose way of showing up in the world is not something that really resonates, um, or I just don't have time to put into considering that, because sometimes a critic and or a troll might have an, a valid point that you could actually use to do what you do better. But if I don't have time for all of that, I just say, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Because we talked about this yesterday. Everyone is doing what they think they need to do, and they think that, that what they're doing is right. So when you thank someone for taking the time and putting in the effort of reaching out and criticizing, you know, whatever it is, they think it's feedback. They think it's they're being generous. If you just thank them, that's like the end of the conversation because you definitely don't want to get into an argument with them. And then, then it's kind of up to you to figure your triggers. If you're, if, you know, if you are triggered by that, if you have a, you know, reaction that, that, that's unhealthy and unhelpful and impeding your ability to continue to do your thing, um, that now kind of becomes your responsibility and, and, and you can do what you need to do to manage that. But that whole, thank you for sharing your perspective has helped me collapse time in terms of spinning cycles of here's how I'm going to get my revenge or here's what I should have said or I, here's how I'm going to get that person you know back or here's how I'm going to respond to that like on so like I don't know if this is happening in real life or social media or a little bit of both but on social media I'm real that's like not helpful delete you know no oh still trying blocked like I, I just, I just w won't have any of it. And some people say, oh, but you know, you should engage those people. It's like, why? I don't like, I have people that actually value the, like what I'm doing. And I, I want all of my attention to go to them. I, you know, if I don't have time, if, if I don't have time, I don't have time. And, I'd, and it, it's easier if I just don't see you. So yeah, just being intentional about, about things, not just about where you do what you do and where you share what you do, but um, also in in self-management, that self-efficacy piece again. Yusuf, you have four minutes to speak, but if you want me to respond to anything, you have to do it in two minutes or less. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for to everybody to listen, uh, for listening to my madness. I appreciate it. And for the platform for the madness. Um, I actually had a solution for Cato's thing, a direct solution for uh, the mechanism of reconsumption. And I, and I sent it to you, Scott. Uh, you didn't, okay. didn't see the message. Um, that was a very step-by-step -step playbook. This is how you do it. This is why this happens, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, and so and this, this link? Mm -hmm that you want me to share to everyone? Sure, if you would if you want to do that. Okay, so there it is, so that anybody can go check that out. And you're you're very welcome, Natalie. I'm glad that was helpful and useful. Cool. Yeah, micro steps. Micro steps are really important. Micro steps ensure that you don't blow yourself up. Micro steps ensure that you can walk slowly away um, which will make the predator not chase after you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is great. Um, tomorrow's call, uh, also going to be at 10 o'clock Eastern. Um, I think, uh, it will actually, for those of you that kind of have things in place, it's really kind of, um, the optimization piece of how, how do you make everything that you're doing be done more effectively, efficiently be done better. Um, and then uh, all of you have very generously already um, earned your way into the bonus call on Tuesday. So if you're able to attend that, um, yeah, I'm gonna 
going to be do, sharing some things. Is that, that, at, is that at 10 o'clock also? Uh, on Tuesday? Probably. Probably. Um, yeah. But basically, I'm going to share two things that will amplify everything we've been talking about. And then um, I'll also kind of like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tear down the curtain and let you take a look at all the um, inception and B messaging that have been going on um, throughout this whole entire process of, um, you know, marketing and, um, and, and I'll share, share the result, like what, what actual impact it had, um, you know, for me and, and, uh, in my business. So that'll all happen on Tuesday. And with that, it's 1129. I did it. Um, so time for Scott to get in the kitchen, put his apron on, put his frilly apron on and start making uh, today's omelet. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Oh, and last, well, everyone here is um, obviously already knows about the Monday on purpose call. That's 11 o'clock Eastern on Mondays. You are invited to invite anyone you like to that call. So the Monday on purpose and Friday on purpose call next week are open invitation. Like anyone that wants to attend can attend. So if there's anyone that you know that's would be a good fit or has expressed interest but not shown up or signed up, um, they're, they're free to join. You can share the the Zoom link with them. And with that, it's eleven thirty. Got to go. Thank you.